Good evening. On behalf of the His History Matters Planning Team and the Library of Isothermal Community College, we welcome you. If, you're, if this is your first time here, I'll just let you know now that there are restrooms on both sides. The men's is on that side and the women's is on this side. <coughs> also, before I introduce our speakers for this evening, the History Matters planning team, which is Angel Ledbetter, Chivas Bradley, Clint Tuttle, Philip White, and myself, we'd like to make a special presentation to our team's director, Kathy Webb. Kathy is the library specialist here at ICC. It was her idea to plan programs about the history of our region and then present those for free to the community. She's put in the most hours, contacted the most people, and even given money out of her own pocket because she believes history does matter. We just want to say thank you, Kathy, for all you've done. This flower basket that you thought I thought brought for decor is yours from the team. <laughs> it's just a small token of appreciation. Um, and we chose tonight to show our gratitude. This is not the last night. We have one big finale in May, but we're, our focus will be on military appreciation, so we just want to do that tonight for you. Um, yes. <laughs> That's what I was going to say, is I knew you appreciate that too, and for us to give, us a, give her a hand, but we do appreciate you, Kathy, and all you have done. Now, on to our program. Um, as our team deliberated over various program topics, we were all captivated by the idea of exploring the origins of the first churches in our area. Chivas Bradley remarked that if this region is considered the Bible Belt, then Rutherford County could be considered its buckle. So we'd like to thank Chivas for all the time he has put into coordinating this program tonight. He's gathered quite a lineup for you all with representatives from the Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, and Episcopal churches. You can read more about our guest speakers in your program, but Pastor Lance Smith will lead us off. He serves as the pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Forest City. Reagan Clark will follow. He has served for 40 years as a lay speaker and lay leader in the United Methodist Church. Then Chivas Bradley, one of Rutherford County's official historians, will speak. He serves as a teacher and a deacon at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. He is also a historian for the Green River Baptist Association and has served as chair of the historical committee for the Baptist State Convention of North Carolina. Wrapping up our evening will be Reverend Tony Bellhue, who serves as the rector of both St. Francis and St. Gabriel's Episcopal Churches in Rutherfordton. So let's begin our inspirational journey from brush arbors to stained glass and learn about the development of the first churches in this area. Pastor Smith. Well, you don't have to look very far back in history to realize that there's a common thread to every place and every entity. The thread is a very basic component of any religion, faith, community, region, nation, or state. One of the most basic components of all of these things is its people, their basic needs, their history, their background, their beliefs, their faith, lifestyles, and the main resources that they hold dear. Presbyterianism in Rutherford County is a story that begins way back in history, way back in European history, actually, as far back as the 1600s, where people were subjected to uh, a church that didn't really give them much information, just kind of spoon-fed them what they needed to know. They didn't have Bibles. They had a priest that would be speaking in Latin, and not very many of them spoke Latin. So it was all what they gathered from the stained glass windows and the tapestries in the church. And it wasn't much, but it was their key to the next life. 
And so the faithful stayed with it. They didn't have any choices. And then something happened. A thing called the Reformation happened when a few of those Catholic, uh, holy Catholic uh, priests and theologians decided that, wait a minute, this isn't all there is. There's more to it. And they started questioning. And with questions came growth. And with growth came a split, came some major splits. Presbyterianism came as uh, the Reformed tradition, and it comes from the teachings of John Calvin originally. A Catholic priest named John Knox heard John Calvin speak and studied with him in Geneva, took all that information back to Scotland. And things that were happening in Britain at the same time was there was a big split, and we're going to hear a little bit more of that from some of these other people that are going to talk to you about it. But uh, Presbyterianism became the Church of Scotland. And then the Scots, some of them migrated to Ireland. And so it became the Scots and the Scots-Irish. Of course, there was not much room to grow in Europe either. Not only was the church oppressive, but the government was oppressive. It was a feudal system. Very few people owned land, and everybody was oppressed. And so everybody was looking towards this new world that had just been discovered as a place to go, as a big pull factor to bring people here. You've got to understand that that feudal government and the, the, all that in the in Roman church, that's what drew people to the new world, to try to find more opportunities to find land and, as well as freedom to worship to worship the way in which they felt God intended for them. Presbyterianism itself is an interesting concept. It's not really that different from any other Christian denomination other than the way it does its government. Presbyterianism is based on a, a form of government and that name Presbyterianism, Presbytery, all has to do with the, little, with the little assemblies that are formed within the church. These are elected officials that make all the decisions for the church. It's not a top-down system of government like an Episcopal or a priest situation. And it's not a bottom-up like a congregational system like we'll hear about the Baptist church. It's elected officials and then they, they work together to form what they call a presbytery. And that's the main difference in Presbyterianism. Presbyterians were among the earliest Reformed immigrants to America. They st settled in the East Coast and began to push westward into the American wilderness, founding congregations as early as 1630. And in 1706, seven Presbyterian ministers formed the first Presbyterian presbytery in the New World. The clergy assumed the freedom to organize and the right to worship and preach and teach and administer the sacraments. But the growing population and immigration prompted the presbytery to organize a synod in 1717 with four constituent presbyteries. And of course, the more people that came, the less room there was. And here was all this land out here that was uncharted. And so those early Presbyterians that were part of the churches in Pennsylvania decided to move a little down, a little further south. So they followed the edge of the mountains down this way. And these Scots-Irish loved the rolling hills and the mountains that they found here in Rutherford County. And they started settling here. The original settlers were from Gettysburg and up in that area. And these freedom-seeking Scots and Irish brought the Presbyterianism to Cane Creek and the Broad River Valley area, which later became part of Rutherford County that we know today, a part called Britain. Britain, I'm told, was the first church that was established west of the Catawba River, first organized church. The original version of the Britain Presbyterian Church was organized in August of 1768 by the Reverend Daniel Thatcher, along with three elders and 20 members. There's probably a few churches in Rutherford County that are about 20 members. 
I serve one of them. So I can, I can relate to that. This was done by approval of the Presbytery of Hanover and would be known as Little Britain. The land chosen to, contained a vacant burial ground and it belonged at that time to Great Britain, hence the name Little Britain. Later, a large acreage of land, around 50 acres, was granted to William Long by King George III. And Mr. Long, in turn, deeded seven acres of this land to Britain Church. Now, the first Britain Church, we'll see that, was made a lot like the cabins of those early years. It was made of logs. It was recorded finished in the fall of 1768 and remained on the first site for 32 years. Then in 1800, some members wanted a new building constructed. So Mr. William Porter was a landowner who deeded two and a half acres to Britain so they could build a second church, which was still a log church, similar to this one, which was just two and a half, just a, a one, I'm sorry, one and a half miles up Union Mills Road on the Young Farm. The second church would be referred to as Little Britain to distinguish it from the log structure, which had been called Old Britain. This church site was also contained a cemetery, which has long been abandoned due to neglect and no longer exists. In 1850, church members decided they wanted to move back to the original location. This became the third church constructed for Britain. And it was modern. I don't know. Yeah, it was modern. It had, had sawn lumber, clapboards, dressed lumber. It also contained a balcony in the back part of the church that was occupied by slaves. Following the Revolutionary War, the members of Britain petitioned the Mecklenburg Presbytery and asked for another T to be added to their name to distinguish them from Great Britain. From this Britain church came three other church starts in Rutherford County. Duncan's Creek Presbyterian, which is now closed, was started in 1807. Union Mills in 1902. Bostick also closed, which though it was sponsored by Four City First Pres, the entire list of its charter members had come from the Britain Church, and lastly, Rutherfordton Presbyterian Church. I think we've got a slide, maybe of this. There's the church. I'll let you look at that just for a second or two. That's pretty fancy. That's the modern church. <laughs> and now if you go to the next one, that's the brick church that you see today. Surrounding that church is a cemetery. It holds the graves of brave veterans from the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War. I can't believe I did that. <laughs> Probably want to sell me burial insurance. <laughs> the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, World War I and World War II, as well as the graves of many other prominent citizens from the over 200 years in existence. In 1968, the cemetery was restored. I think we have a slide of the cemetery restorations. There we go. The cemetery was restored uh, with the help of the community members and church members from all the Presbyterian and all the churches in Rutherford County, actually. There was a grant from the Griffith Rutherford chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution Together with the church, they bought five bronze markers for the graves of the Revolutionary War veterans. In 1967, a care and maintenance fund began to help manage the cemetery and donations were made for its upkeep. This is a thriving community. Britain still has a congregation that meets every Sunday morning. About the size of the original one now. Love to have you stop out and see them sometime. I'm sure they would love for you to stop out and worship with them on a Sunday morning. Thank you so much. God bless you.
I am not a minister. <laughs> I'm Reagan Clark. My main claim to fame was working with Phil White all these years. We were in education. In fact, I'm still in education. I'm in my 54th year in education. Work here part-time at Isothermal. Well, at the Polk campus. And I didn't know what today's topic exactly was. I was somebody else was supposed to do it, but all I knew I was supposed to talk about Methodism. And then my wife told me today that Diane told her that the topic was Chimney Rock, and I'm thinking, this is not going to go well. <laughs> but then Philip told me that Chimney Rock was last time, so I am, I'm okay. I think I'm on the right page now. So I want to talk about Methodism. And I haven't been a Methodist all my life, but one of the things that attracted me to look at Methodism was John Wesley. And I'm going to give you a real quick fact sheet on John Wesley, because you're going to forget everything else I say, because after about three or four minutes, you start tuning me out. But Amy, you better not tune me out. No, sir. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to give you a, a little fact sheet that I put together. That I, John Wesley wrote a medical textbook. And it actually was th uh, published 32 different times. And it was home remedies. But it's still thought of in the medical community as wise practices. I didn't know this. He, uh, he coined the phrase, agree to disagree. And he coined that phrase because of his relationship with George Whitfield, who was a uh, minister who was leading part of the Great Awakening, and sometimes, and they were friends at Oxford, and actually formed a club there that I'll talk about a little bit later. But they didn't always agree, and so they agreed to disagree. I found this one interesting. He was a circuit rider. That was the whole premises of his Methodism, was to get to these communities on horseback. In his lifetime, he rode 250,000 miles Ten times around the earth. Most of that happened. He was only in America for a couple of years. Most of his uh, travel was in Great Britain. But 250,000 miles. This one appealed to me because he struggled deeply with his faith. And he was told by a mentor, and I will mention this a little later and you'll find out who that mentor was. He told this other uh, pastor that he didn't think he had enough faith and he told Wesley, he says, preach faith until you have it. And then because you have it, you will pre preach faith. Originally, the term Methodist was a derogatory term pinned to Wesley and his uh, ministers because of their mythology. And his mother, Suzanne, which we'll talk a little bit about Suzanne, she was, she, when she taught, she homeschooled him and she said, the method is the most important thing of everything you do. And he believed in that methodology. And so they made fun of him, and that stuck with him and became the Methodist. Found this one interesting. I tried to ignore it, but he did say it. One of his counsels to people was, eat less than you desire. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, he tipped the scales at 128 pounds, so it worked. Uh, he never intended to split from the Church of England, but the Church of England sort of split themselves away from him because he started ordaining ministers in the New World to present the sacraments. And so he was disavowed by the church, but his goal wasn't to start a new church. <sighs> Don't know if this is his or not, but it's credited to him. And I remember seeing this on T-shirts when I would go to Methodist conference. Follow this one. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all times you can, as long as ever you can. And supposedly that was a, John, that was a Wesley quote. This is what drew me to the Methodism. He didn't believe that the gospel of Christ was about religion. He believed it was about social holiness. And that was one of the reasons he had a falling out with the Church of England. And it's interesting, Methodism, which today has 32 million 
members, started out as a holy club of four. John, his brother Charles, George Whitfield was in that originally, and one other guy. And that was the beginning of the Holy Club at Oxford University. And that was what has turned into 32 million people today. Uh, they held themselves accountable daily. They met daily for prayer, daily for Bible study. By the time Wesley died in 1791, the Methodist Church had 132,000 people. So it, a lot was working for him. But let's back up. If, if the Methodists were not here, or the Presbyterian, or Episcopal, the, one of the earliest churches in England was the Church of England. It, and it, there's a church that's given date back to the third century, known as the Anglican Church. But in 1533, the Pope disavow disavowed the uh, membership into the Church of England because King Henry VIII wanted an annulment in his marriage because the wife he had at that time had not given him any children, Catherine of Aragon, he asked for an annulment from the Catholic Church and they wouldn't give it to him. So at that time, he made the Church of England, and I'll refer to it sometimes as that, sometimes I'll refer to it as the Anglican Church, the official Church of England. And it, it, it was, it, there we go. Those massive churches were not very inviting to the common folk. And so, some people have said that John Wesley, because of his ministry, may have saved England because by the time these churches were identified, the common man couldn't go there. It was full of, the streets were full of common man. What had happened, people had left the farms, come into the towns to work. Some of the Industrial Revolution had brought people in. And they became, they were uneducated, they were dirty, they were poor, and the church didn't welcome them. Their future was pretty dark and gloomy. And in 1703, July 17, 1703, John Wesley was born to Samuel and Suzanne Wesley. And he was one of 15 to 19 children. Now, they, they, the original text I saw said 19, but I think only 15 of them survived very long, so credit to 15 children. And his father was a rector in the Church of England. And he was, his father was an Oxford graduate. But it was his mother who made the difference in his life. So, yes, uh, she declared to her two sons, Charles and John, that there was something to these two boys and that God had, and I'll tell you a little bit about why she said that later, but she became their teacher. She taught them Hebrew and Greek because she felt like they needed to read the original text of the Old and New Testament. And her method of influence stayed with him throughout his whole time as a minister. She fell in bad with the Anglican Church because she started leading a Bible study for women. Over 200 women started coming to the Bible study and the Anglican Church wouldn't let them meet behind the doors of the church anymore. At age six, there you go, West, the, the rectory that um, the Wesley family lived in burned to the ground. But in that fire, they realized they'd gotten everyone out except for John. And they looked, and he was in the second story at the window, and it was nothing but flames. And two of the firefighters actually put each other on their shoulders and pulled him to safety. And this quote became one of John Wesley's to live by. He thought he had been plucked from the fire by God, and his mother reminded him often that there was something in God's plan for him. 1720, he attended Christ Church School, and then in 1726, he went to Oxford, and in 1728 was ordained as an Anglican priest. But he and his brother began to share this vision of holy living, and they began to gather these four guys called the Holy Club, George Whitfield being one of them, and held themselves accountable daily to Bible study and prayer. 
And John did something that was unheard of by the Anglican church. He took to the streets to take care of the poor, set up clinics, set up schools. But at this time, he was still an Anglican priest. But he decided in 1735 that he needed to spread his ministry to the new colonies. And so he came to Georgia. And he stayed there for a couple of years and went back very discouraged. In fact, he said, I went there and the only thing I brought back was a spiritual peace that was taught to me by the Native Americans. But it was on his trip back to London and those two years that he was in America, by the way, is the only time that he was in America. The rest of his ministry took place by those people that were placed here by John Wesley. But on his way back to England, the ship they were in experienced a horrible storm. I don't know if you ever, if you've like me, I visited places where you see these little old ships and you wonder how in the world they got here. But this ship almost sank. But he noticed that while he was panicking for his life, there was a group of German Moravians that were cornered in the boat singing hymns and praying and having a good time. He couldn't understand it. And he says, how can you do this? And they said, are you not saved? And that really challenged him. In fact, when he gets back to England, he attends a meeting with one of these Moravian named Peter Boland. They attended a meeting on May the 24th, 1738. Now, my wife says that she's actually been there, but she tells me these things sometimes. I'm not sure, but she said she went there. And because there, there is a marker there that marks it. Uh, and it's called Aldersgate. That was the name of the street that it was on. And a movement broke out while they were there. And for the first time in John Wesley's life, he said, in fact, his quote was, well, actually, to be back up, the, the sermon that night was a, um, uh, from Galatians, and it talked about the warming of man's heart by God. And he said suddenly he felt the physical warming of his heart, and it, it, it lit him on fire. And he decided, you know, regardless of what the Church of England expected out of him, he was going to the streets, and he would go to the brickyards and the mines, and he started preaching worthiness and forgiveness. And as you pointed out, that wasn't exactly the message of the church back then. In fact, he said God's grace has no pecking order. A true message of do unto others. He was preaching in a building one evening and as many as a thousand people had crowded into the room to hear him and the floor collapsed. So, then he decided, we've got to have a place to worship. So he built a place called The Room. And he built that in Bristol, England. Still stands today. He purchased land. And he used it not only for his ministry, but it was used for housing the poor. Um, and while he was involved in this, his brother Charles wrote over his lifetime, 6,500 hymns. When I first started attending the Methodist Church, I was so surprised when I would start flipping through our red hymnal, how many hymns were written by Charles Wesley. One of those hymns, though I recognize, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, written by Charles Wesley. In 1739, headquarters were built in London called The House and it became the center of worship seven days a week. And it also became the house that housed his mother, Suzanne. And the Church of England told him to cease his ministry. He went and stood on his father's tomb and began to preach. And thousands attended. Well, one of the ways he knew that the church would get him was you can't have people gathered in those kinds of numbers. It was going against complete. So he began to break these pub people up into small study groups, putting them out in homes and study groups. And then he decided to take his ministry and it spread to the new world. Yeah, thank you. 13 colonies. Um, and I told you that his ministry was not about churches. It was about taking the word to the people. And they did it on horseback. 
and they were called circuit riders. And circuit riders would cover a physical area and they may go into a community and stay two or three days and then move on. And then oftentimes they would be assigned the same circuit and stay on that circuit for years. Um, but the, what was happening during this time was a, an outbreak in the 1730s. Actually, it was called the Second Great Awakening. But it was, it was an, the Enlightenment in Europe had caused the common man to open and question things around him that he had never questioned before. And so by then, the sermon of John Wesley began to reach the ears of common man. Grace, grace, grace. And this grace began to take hold in the colonies. And in the 1730s and 1740s, which is called the Second Great Awakening, many people think that's what led to this idea of gaining independence and not being under a king. I remember as a teenager, I was telling Amy, Amy's a librarian over at Spindell Elementary, I grew up in that library. You weren't there then, of course, Amy. I, know. I have to brag on. Amy was one of my first spelling bee champions at Rutherford County when I was a director of middle schools. So I'll never forget. I took, we went to Charlotte. Uh, you want to spell for him? <laughs> no. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> but I remember reading, uh, while I was in that library, a sermon by a, a minister named Jonathan Edwards. And even though most of it was over my head, as most things were back then anyway, it, it, I, I could see how it could lead you to, to wanting more. And that's what John Wesley wanted. And he was influenced on the writings of Solomon Stoddard and, of course, his friend George Whitfield, who he agreed with to disagree. And all this was called the Great Awakening within the colonies. And not only did it preach grace, 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 but it talked about social reform. It talked about temperance. The method is called for abolition. They, they, these lay ministers were told if they had slaves, to they had to free them. They restricted the use of tobacco. And then later, a, another great awakening happened under the leadership of, of, of some of the speakers that I remember was Dwight L. Moody. And during that time, he developed the YMCA and uh, missionary work and other denominations began to rise to the fore. And then I remember being a part of what we call the Fourth Revival or Fourth Great Awakening. We called it the Jesus Movement. Do you I know, you're all old enough to know it. I, I remember, because I was part of it, I, I, I was the guitar player, and we would go around and we started learning all these scriptures and putting them to tune, but we weren't allowed to do them in churches. In fact, the first church that we did it in on a regular basis, denominational church, was a Methodist church, and it didn't go over very well in the beginning. <clears throat> you know. In fact, I asked last week, I'm a, I'll, I go to First UMC now, I've not been there very long, and I, I, I was asked, I've got to preach in about three weeks, and so in my sermon I was thinking about doing a song, which many of you know, Mary Did You Know, uh, because that was going to be the title of my sermon, Mary Knew. You know, Mary, Mary knew very little, but, but she knew enough. But I was going to have them do the song, and my, Elaine says, well, I'm not sure you can take a guitar in the First United Methodist Church to main service. We have an early morning service. That's all we use, a guitar. And so I've changed my sermon topic now, so it doesn't matter. But, but that was part of that fourth revival that took place. Now let's talk about the beginning of American Methodism. Methodism began in the mid-1700s, and Wesley ordained Thomas Koch to be the superintendent of the Methodist Church. This is when the Church of England broke completely with John. They didn't recognize this movement, and they marked this separation by labeling it Methodism. So in December of 1784, these Methodists held a meeting and called the Christmas Conference. And at that time, Thomas Koch, who had been appointed by John Wesley to head up this Methodism in the Americas, he ordained Francis Asbury as his co-superintendent. And I bring up Francis Asbury because Asbury's ministry is the one that began to trickle down 
into this area. At this conference, they claimed, or, or they, they commanded that all people turn loose of their slaves, release them. And so there was a freedman named Harry Hoosier. He was a black man, and he started traveling with Francis Asbury. And he learned the scriptures with him. And I say this because Hoosier then becomes the first black ordained Methodist pastor. Asbury, during his 45 years of service, put in some 6,000 miles. And like I say, it trickled down. Uh, it's sort of interesting where, it, where, it, where I was fishing with Don Hastings and we were up in the uh, Watauga County fishing on the Holston River and I came up on a plaque on the side of the river and, it, and I was reading about it. And the, this Holston region was Francis Asbury's conference. And this is the ministry area that he was in charge of. Um, and by 1792, it had influenced people in Rutherford County. I'm going to back up a little bit. I've got to thank Lucy Earls. Lucy, raise your hand. I'm, I'm closing with this. Is What happened when Methodism hits Rutherford County? I did not know this when I first began, but a church named Oak Grove, United Methodist Church, and that's the present day church, and I'm going to apologize because I sent three pictures and some there between here and there. We didn't get them here. So I'm going to tell you about those churches and try to give you a physical description. But let me back up and tell you how Methodism got into Rutherford County. In 1789, Daniel Asbury, and I have no clue whether or not he was kin to Francis Asbury or not, and John McKee were appointed ministers in what was called the Yadkin service, circuit. And then it trickled down into Lincoln County and became known as the Lincoln Circuit by 1790. Daniel Asbury found a war fire and some friends in his circuit in a little community called Ellenby on a farm that was owned by Jeremiah Blanton. Now Jeremiah was only I might be wrong about this, 18, 19, 20 years old. And um, just a young man, but he was so caught up in this ministry of Asbury's that he invited his friends. You did have it. Yeah. You lied to me. <laughs> okay, different order, I'm sorry. Thank you, it saves me from Lucy's wrath. So he invited his friends to the, his farm and he told them they were going to raise a barn. And this was the barn they raised. And once it was raised, he told them this was now going to be the worship place. And it was called Oak Grove Church. And the reason I understand that he got the name Oak Grove was because Jeremiah Blanton had gone around with his knife and whittled and cut the saplings back around the area, the Oak Grove. That correct, Lucy? I hope. Okay. Um, Jeremiah was married in 1798. They raised a large farm. He lived to be 98 years old. So he got to see the fruits of his ministry. And then, I'm looking for the year, the second building. Oh, we do have it. 1885. You might notice that this one is the same sort of layout that Brittany looked like, except this one is identified. See those two doors? One door is for the women to go in and worship, and one door was for the men to go in. They were not allowed to go in the same door. And then the present day building, I don't know if we have that one or not, but the present day building, there we go. Is that, I guess that's Oak Grove, present day building. Uh, yeah. uh, it was built 1949, Does that sound right? That's the year I was born, so it's 70, a little over 70, I, I'm young 70-ish. Um, and so this, as far as, and I've asked Lucy, I've asked other people, as far as we know, this is probably the oldest Methodist church. Providence was founded in 1790. So, okay. And we did, we could, I, I even went through the conference to try to find that out and couldn't get it. 
I appreciate it. So, all right. That's the Methodism. In order to talk about the beginnings of the Baptist faith in this area, one must mention a pastor or preacher named Shubel Stearns. He was converted in 1745 while attending a revival in Connecticut that was led by George Whitfield, who you've heard about. And after feeling a call to preach, he, he led 15 of his family members to the Lord. And he persuaded them to move to Virginia and to help start a church which was part of the New Light movement at that time. He spent several years in deep Bible study and became convinced that he should have no creed but the Bible. He aligned himself with the Baptist uh, teaching. Uh, he <clears throat> considered especially John 3.16 and Matthew 28, 9 through 20, which caused him to have what a, a great burden for the unchurched people in the back country of the Carolinas. And this, <clears throat> this conviction led him to have a difference which was considered by most at that time to be a slight difference with the regular Baptists. And this evangelistic fervor caused him to uh, claim 2 Corinthians 6, 17, come ye out from among them and be ye separate. And so he decided that he would consider his group of people separate Baptists. And these original 16 moved from that uh, area in Virginia to Randolph County, North Carolina, along an area known as Sandy Creek. In 1755, he started a separate Baptist church there at the intersection of three old trading paths. Reverend Stearns preached with an outpouring of the Spirit that brought conviction and repentance of sins so that converts would die to self and be born of the Spirit to a new life. He taught that only those who had this born-again experience were fit subjects for baptism. Within two years, this small congregation had grown to over 600 members. They had established two additional churches with over 300 members within a few miles of Sandy Creek, and they had ordained at least 40 preachers. And this church, Sandy Creek Baptist Church, still exists today and is known as the Mother Church of the Southern Baptist Convention. By 1758, Philip Mulkey and Daniel Marshall had arrived in Union, South Carolina to organize the Fair Forest Baptist Church and in the early 1770s, they were preaching to anyone who would listen in the settlements along the Sandy Run Creek, along the Green River, and along the headwaters of the Broad River in the Hickory Nut Gorge. Out of this outreach, the Green River Baptist Church was organized in 1778, somewhere between Mill Spring and the White Oak Creek near the Green River. This was the first Baptist church in the area now served by Isothermal Community College. The church became inactive in the early 1780s due to the Revolutionary War, and they only had services sporadically during the 1790s until Reverend Joel Blackwell reorganized the church about uh, uh, 1800. The Green River Baptist Association, when it was organized in 1841, took their name from that original Green River Baptist Church. About 1860, the name of that church was changed to White Oak. And again, in 1885, 
It was changed to the First Baptist of Mill Springs. And another church called Green River Baptist had been organized near the mouth of Green River by 1875. It is sometimes said that Baptists multiply by dividing. And that was the case with the original Green River and Greens Creek churches. In 1797, while the Green River congregation was only meeting sporadically, 40 members who were traveling several miles to attend services pulled out of the Green River Baptist Church and formed a church of their own known today as the Green Creek First Baptist. Most of the Baptist churches in Polk County can in some way trace their existence back to those two churches. Bills Creek Baptist Church was organized in 1782 as the first Baptist church in what is now Rutherford County. A few families between Bills Mountain and the Hickory Nut Gorge had become Baptist without a regular meeting place as a result of hearing preaching in the 1770s. This group chose a preacher by the name of William Haynes as their first pastor. Very little is known about William Haynes except it's thought he lived uh, in the Shingle Hollow area while he was pastoring that original church. Reverend Permitter Morgan became the pastor of Bills Creek Church early in 1785. And under his leadership, the first log meeting house was built. Permenter Morgan came from, to Rutherford County after moving here from Randolph County, and he had likely been a part of that original Sandy Creek Church group. He was a prominent minister in this area for a number of years, and he died in McDowell County in 1834. The church at Bills Creek, that's, yeah, had been on property owned by John Whiteside until 1836. When Whiteside died, Isaac Connor bought the property from his estate, and the church obtained some land from him soon thereafter. This new frame structure was built in 1850 to replace, or not this one, but one similar to this, was built in 1850 to replace the old log building. In 1908, the membership was about 200, and the new building was built and dedicated. Automobile travel permitted better attendance, and by 1949, more than 300 people were attending services at Bills Creek. By 1965, a number of additions had been made to the building for Sunday school, for a parsonage, and other needs, and the building was renovated, and the brick veneer building was built. This brick building today is very functional and provides for an active congregation. Bills Creek has been involved in the organization of at least eight other churches in northwestern Rutherford County. And from these humble beginnings, there are currently more than 100 Baptist churches in Rutherford County with resident membership of over 18,000 and an average Sunday morning worship attendance approaching 8,000 Baptists in Rutherford County. How many of you know how to say Episcopal? <laughs> All right. When I joined the Army in 1982, they couldn't spell it on my, my dog tag. So I've um, been Episcopalian all my life. I um, just want to talk about, a little bit about, because I think these gentlemen have already covered a lot of history, um, especially about the Anglican Communion, the Anglican Church and the Church of England, um, which a lot of us started out as, right? But when we came over to the United States, 
we had the, the Anglican Church over here, so the 1600s, and then when I'm focusing more on North Carolina. In North Carolina, we had a hard time with trying to get people to come to the wilderness. So if you look across our state, there's about, I think, 540 miles of our state. And when we had people coming to try to get some Episcopalians here, they only wanted to go 350 miles. So that left our diocese, which is now the Western, the Diocese of Western North Carolina, that left a lot of land from right and around Charlotte all the way west that was untouched. So we had the diocese, they had Virginia that they asked for them to help us out in North Carolina. So we didn't have a diocese here. So the Episcopal Church, let me step, step back. The Anglican Church came over here, but during the 1700s, the Revolutionary War, we could not get our bishops consecrated by the Church of England because there was a little war there. And so we got the Scottish to help us with that. And so with that, we ended up having the Episcopal Church in, in North America. So we, we asked the churches, the bishop in Virginia to come and help us down here. They, they would send interim missionary pastors, priests to come down here. Some of them stayed a little while. Some of them came here, turned back around, and went back home. They covered the whole state. So they liked being near the coast. The coast was nice. They liked being sort of like in the middle of the state, Tarboro, Wilson, that area. But when they started getting further west, they did not want to be here. The roads were poor. It was mountainous. There was, it was just something that they weren't used to. So they would go back up north. The ones that stayed helped us to flourish here. Now, part of that is the bachelor mint, the mining that was here. That helped. But that only lasts a little while because when the gold rush happened in California, well, the money went that way. And so we, we came back to being, trying to struggle to have the Episcopal Church here. Um, but we have a couple of families here, the Cox family, and the, we had the, the Mills family here, and the McDowell and the Carson family here that helped us maintain our establishment here at the Episcopal Church. I would say that if you go to the slide, next slide, these are the churches that originally started in Rutherford, Rutherford 10. On the left is St. John, so if you drive down Main Street, you can see St. John, and that's the oldest standing church in Rutherford It's not no longer Episcopal Church. I think um, the owner now uses it as a studio. In the middle, that's St. Francis Episcopal Church. The top left, sorry, top right is St. Luke's, and then down at the bottom is St. Gabriel's. Next, please. So these three churches are still what I want to concentrate on. St. John's on the left there. This church was established in the, really the 1870s. And with this church, St. Francis members would meet there as well as St. Gabriel's. They were, not, they were, not, they were all St. John's at that time. Sunday morning, the white members would meet. And Saturday evening, the black members would meet. And um, so when they outgrew, the, Saint Fr the church out got bigger, then the Cox family, they had their small chapel right where St. Francis is now, and they started meeting there. They, that church, the St. Francis, was established, they started building in 1898, and it was consecrated in 1899. No, 19, 1898, 1999 to 1900 consecration. St. Gabriel's, they started meeting in homes. And then they started meeting in one particular house. You can see it off of Ridgecrest. And there, that church was actually started being built in 1913 and then was consecrated in 1915. So you have a 16-year difference between the churches. The middle church, St. Francis, the church is 
It's a, in an old English style, 14th century style. Um, there's, if you ever go by there, you can see the cloister that's on there now and um, the cloister house. St. Gabriel's is a carpenter style church. So they look fairly, very different. The masonry, the everything is different. Um, but I tell you, they're both warm, warm churches. A little bit about St. Saint, Saint Luke's. I'm, we can go back to the next slide. Can you go? Um, so St. John's. Okay. St. Luke's. Um, I don't know if you have that one. You can go back all the way up to the. Okay. One more. I just want to touch on St. Luke's. St. Luke's was built on the church grounds. If you go by there um, where the emergency room parking lot is, that's St. Luke's. And that was built by the Norrises who came down from Philadelphia to visit and the Cox family and they came and established, they wanted to have a chapel there and so that's still there but it's not functioning as a church. Okay. If you go to St. Francis. Um, this is St. Francis. Um, the church itself now has about 61 average Sunday attendance members. Um, there is a day school that has been a, that was met formally and at St. John's and then moved down to the church and then now it meets in the at the parish house and we have about 20 students. St. Gabriel's has active member of about 21 people um, there. Next one. The two churches I was called almost three years ago as the rector. And one of the things that in the history of St. Francis and St. Gabriel's, that's the first time they ever called the same priest. St. Francis started out with um, interant, interant uh, priests coming to them and offering assistance. But St. Gabriel's never had, had a priest there for a long time until the 40s. Um, what else is different? As far as St. Saint, Saint Francis and St. Gabriel's, right now they do a lot of things together um, under shared, some shared worship, some shared programs, but they have distinct services. So St. Francis meets at 9.30 in the morning and St. Gabriel's is 11 o'clock in the morning on Sundays. Um, a little bit about, um, so, a little about the makeup of the Episcopal Church. We are, we are part of the Anglican Communion, so we have the Church of England, but we all, we're separate as far as we're part of the Communion, but we're Episcopal Church and we're international. We're in several countries. We're now, there are three dioc Episcopal dioceses in North Carolina. The main one, which was established from out of Virginia and established because we needed one, was North Carolina, and then there was the East, the Diocese of East Carolina, and then in 1922, we became the Diocese of Western North Carolina, and we cover Denver and Gastonia westward to the Tennessee border. We are part of the Piedmont Deanery, and those are the churches, just the buildings that are in the Piedmont Deanery, of which St. Francis and St. Gabriel is a part of it. Next. And this is our mission for St. Francis, is to go into the world making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all that Jesus teaches. One of the things that was established with the St. Francis is going out and reaching the needy, the people that needed help. And I think that's something that St. Francis continues into today. We serve and help with the welcome table once a month, we, we have a feeding for community Thanksgiving, 1,100 people, 1,100 meals for thanks, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. We offer blessing bags to those who are, are unhoused, and we also support uh, the local hotel um, in Spindale. St. Gabriel's, this is their mission, um, to welcome and comfort the weary, to feed and clothe the needy, to support and defend the oppressed, all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as a historically black Episcopal church, St. Gabriel's is located in New Hope community. 
It's underserved. There is no, it's a food desert. There are no Dollar Generals there, uh, no access. So every Wednesday we have a weekly feeding and we serve about 200, 220, uh, 220 meals. And we have St. Francis and the Presbyterian Church helping with us with that weekly. Next. These two churches, it's Episcopal Church is a, is a denomination where we focus on tradition, scripture, and reason. We ask people to bring their whole selves to the church. We welcome everyone, but we ask them to think and bring their brains to everything that we do. And that's the beauty of it, that you can come in from wherever you come from and feel welcome at the Episcopal Church. Um, I think one of the things that for our history and how we did not move as much as the Baptists and the, and the Methodists, one of the things is if you know who your first president was, it was Episcopalian. Mm -hmm. And so we, we had our history based on who people were. And we kind of didn't do what we, were, we could have done. We, we were started as a missionary society. And, and it's still our official title and our official name. But we, we, there's something about being a missionary. And so with the Episcopal Church, we don't expand on that. But every day, we go out and feed and serve and share. Our evangelism looks a little bit different than most other churches. Our churches may be smaller, but our focus is on giving glory to God and all the gifts that he gives us. And that's the thing that's been carried out through our whole time and our whole history. Rutherford County and Rutherford 10 is small. There are not a lot of people who are, who are looking for a church right now. There are some that may need church, and we're here to open those doors to them at all times. I think the beauty of it and being on the stage is that there are so many choices for anyone who's here, and you'll find a church that suits you. And one of the things that a, a priest that I, um, the church I came from, he said, if the church that you're at now, this is not the church for you, I will help you find a church that suits you. And I think that's, that's important because all of us, different stages in our lives, it may be that we're called to be an Episcopalian. It may be that we may be Methodist, Presbyterian, or Baptist because we're all on a journey with our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Can we have another hand for all these people and the wonderful job they've done? I want to thank the team for the beautiful flower and the sweet words. That just proves I never know what's going on because I had no idea. The saddest part about one, one of the saddest parts about this ending, and I'm going to let you go, I promise. One of the saddest parts for me is I'm not going to be able to meet with these people one or two times a month again. For, for a long, long time, and I've been blessed so much to work with Sally and Philip White, Chivas, Clint Tuttle, and Angel Ledbetter. I've learned so much from these people, and it's been such a joy and a blessing. I also want to say, hey, we're in a higher education place, and we've been talking about the Lord. Woohoo! I'm happy about it. I'm happy about it. Um, we are going to have one more of these, and then that, that's it. We, we won't be picking back up next year. We're going to have one more, and it is going to be the first Thursday night, like they've always, most of them have always been, the first Thursday night in May, or first Thursday afternoon at 530. It's going to honor our military of Rutherford County. I, I really hope that everybody that's here would be able and interested in coming back. Um, Philip White is going to be singing the national anthem that day, and I didn't know until a few weeks ago that he's an excellent singer. We are also going to be um, 
There, there's a lot of things. I mean, it, it won't be a long, long program, but there's a lot of things that are going to be going on that afternoon to honor our military. And I hope that we have a, a really good audience and that we have more people here. There are some flyers on the back, if you wouldn't mind picking some up and taking them, if you can just stick them on your refrigerator or if you know somewhere else to put them, that would be wonderful. In conclusion, that night, that afternoon, we are going to be paying tribute to the last person from Rutherford County that was killed in the line of active duty. His name is Christopher Ebert. And I don't know if anybody realizes this, but he was killed in the Iraq War, and that was 20 years ago this year. And his family will be here with us, and I would love for this place to be packed out just, just to show our respect. We've lost a lot of respect in losing our, a lot of our history. Thank you all for coming, and be careful going home.